Uh, good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I am uh, Ken Sasai, uh, uh, moderating uh, this session, opening uh, round the table discussions. Uh, uh, let me begin by, first of all, introducing some upshots uh, of our strategic annual report year 2022. Um, uh, first, yeah, you, you could read, but uh, let me just uh, go through a uh, very uh, simple way. Uh, first, uh, how uh, we see the world today. Already, uh, there had been uh, two speeches. So uh, I don't want to repeat a similar thing, but let me say this. Uh, um, first of all, uh, the, the first and foremost, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has fundamentally overturned European security order and ended so-called post-Cold War era. There could be debate about this, of course, and the fighting is likely to continue for some time, and sus sustainability of Western support for Ukraine and resilience of democracy will be tested. We see change in the positions of China, uh, strengthening its strategic ties with uh, Russia, uh, and uh, countries in the global south uh, are um, diversified, but uh, on the whole, uh, they seem to uh, seek independent positions uh, around the Ukraine issue. It depends on the country you are talking about. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Pacific, uh, uh, no prospect for fundamental improvement in U.S.-China relations uh, and further escalation tension over Taiwan uh, could be could be expected. There are debates also about these issues, but North Korea would continue and accelerate uh, its nuclear and missile developments. Uh, in the meantime, South Korea is expected, I would say, expected to uh, strengthen security ties with Japan and the United States against the background of increasing North Korean threat. And the world is possibly uh, <coughs> uh, uh, moving uh, to be divided into blocks. Of course, there could be some debate what kind of blocks we are talking about. And multilateral cooperation uh, is in more or less uh, in crisis. Uh, countries in the global south also face a challenge of securing their national interests of different kinds. We are going into a new era of fragmentation and instability and the foundations of US-led uh, and rule-based international order is more challenged and threatened. Uh, this year, uh, we, uh, we focus much on the Japanese defense policy and a secu national security policy. And, and uh, f there, uh, we do recognize the fundamental reinforcement of Japan's defense capabilities underway. Uh, conclusion on stable financial resources for the increase in defense spending needs to be reached as soon as possible uh, with the understanding and support of general public. Maximum utilization of existing asset needed while waiting to acquire a standoff capability for counterattack capability. Fortification of defense facility is also urgent. Uh, deepening Japan-US cooperation and establishment of integrated deterrence posture is called for. And that include a joint o operational plans strengthening command and control coordination, and improving credibility of extended deterrence. Uh, recommendations also include uh, those on multi, uh, multiple international and regional agenda. I would simply uh, list uh, the uh, category of the issues and items. Uh, hope that the uh, mm, audience who, who could read if you have a time to do so. Uh, and I would just uh, simply uh, list the uh, 
and the agenda, nuclear arms control and disarmament, economic security, Japan-US relations, relations with China, and North Korea, uh, LOK, Russia, European countries, EU, NATO, and in the Pacific, Middle East, and Africa, multilateral cooperation, including the United States. We can't talk on all these issues all uh, within uh, one or two hours. So uh, let us begin uh, by focusing more on uh, two or three uh, subjects. Uh, one is uh, uh, how you would recognize the current uh, state of affairs of the world. Are we really uh, going into a new Cold War? or not, different kinds. If it is different, what way? Or if there are similarities, what way? And number two is that uh, we'd like to uh, discuss, in that context, uh, we also, I would like, also would like to see uh, the impact of Ukraine issues uh, all over the, uh, this region, including possibly the relationship between uh, Russia and China in the years ahead. And, 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 and thirdly, uh, when it comes to the regional issues, U.S.-Chinese uh, relationship is getting a bit uh, difficult. And so uh, how do you see uh, all this uh, uh, Sino-U.S. Uh, relationship, uh, whether it is getting into a more difficult phase or there could be some uh, ways to moderate and, and to expect some of the constructive way for the two nations to work on. So these are the, some of the issues, but uh, if there is a chance, I'd like to also invite a comment on Japanese defense and security policy, if you will. So uh, let me uh, begin uh, by uh, <coughs> introducing and asking each uh, panelist uh, to speak, uh, roughly five minutes uh, for each. First of all, uh, let me introduce Miss uh, Lisa Kartich on my left. Uh, she is a senior fellow and director in the Pacific Security Program uh, Center for a New American uh, Security. Uh, please, Lisa, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Sasai, and thank you to JIIA for inviting me here today. It certainly is a pleasure to be with you and to be providing remarks this evening. Uh, first, I'll say a few words on Japan's new national security strategy and its new defense policies, um, and then I'll also speak about two other important issues uh, that we're looking at in 2023. Uh, dealing with the Philippines and uh, with India. Uh, so first, I would really like to congratulate uh, the Japanese government and for many of the people in this room for their contribution to the development of the new strategies that Japan has laid out, both the national security strategy and the national defense strategy. Uh, these really are remarkable documents in their clarity and coherence on how Japan should move forward in meeting uh, new threats that are enveloping the Indo-Pacific region, but also the challenges that are facing the international order. And I think these documents rightly connect what is happening in Europe today with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and in the Indo-Pacific uh, with some of the efforts we see there uh, to intimidate and, and dominate in the region. And I think this linkage was revealed over one year ago, particularly on February 4th, 2022, with the announcement of the Russia-China No Limits Partnership. Uh, that pact between Moscow and Beijing and Russia's subsequent invasion of Ukraine three weeks later have produced the greatest challenge to global freedom and order since World War II. And Japan is clear-eyed about the challenges and is taking a bold step forward in leading efforts uh, to challenge these attempts 
to overturn decades of peace and stability. And to make a baseball analogy, I would say that Japan has really stepped up to the plate. Uh, the bold steps that Tokyo is taking include developing counterattack capabilities to protect, uh, protect Japan and her people from the growing threat of missile, missiles in the region. Uh, Japan also will increase security cooperation with its European partners, as well as with countries like Australia and the Philippines, and of course will coordinate more closely with India. And on this last point, let me discuss how the nations of the Philippines and India are facing aggression of their own, and why it's so important for the US, Japan, and Australia to coordinate their defense and security policies with these nations. In the Philippines, President Marcos Jr. is showing that he also is clear-eyed about the threats that the world is facing. After years of stalled efforts on the U.S.-Philippines Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, or EDCA, Washington and the Philippines have agreed to double the number of EDCA bases in the country, giving the U.S. much needed access in the region. This is a major milestone for the U.S.-Philippines alliance and another step toward deterring aggression in the region through a distributed U.S. presence. Manila's openness to cooperating more closely with the United States stems from aggressive actions in the South China Sea. Uh, this includes China's massing of 200 maritime vessels around the Whitsun Reef in the spring of 2021, and more recently, uh, the Chinese directing military-grade lasers at a Philippines vessel that was replenishing its troops at the Second Thomas Shoal on February 6th. Japan and the U.S. can support the Philippines through defense modernization and infrastructure development, and together, the three countries can contribute to deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. Lastly, lastly, let me just say a few words about India and the aggression that it's facing on its borders. Uh, this is an important issue, uh, and we should be watching it very closely. The increased border friction between India and China along their line of actual control. We've seen an increase in intrusions and clashes there over the last few years, and it's becoming an important feature of the Indo-Pacific security environment, and it requires U.S. and Japanese attention. And I think uh, this has brought clarity to India's strategic approach to China, and India's views of the challenges coming from China are beginning to converge with those of the United States and Japan. So let me just stop there and stick with the uh, five minute limit. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lisa, uh, uh, for pointing to the importance of our defense and security concerns in the region around the Philippines and some other important parts of the region. Now, uh, let me uh, uh, turn to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Bill Emmott. Uh, uh, he is a frequent, uh, regular participant to this dialogue. Thank you for coming. Uh, he is a chairman of Trustee, uh, the Institute for International Strategic Study, WIWS in London. Uh, Bill, you have the floor, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Sasai, and thank you very much for having me again at the Tokyo Global Dialogue. It's always reassuring to be invited back, that uh, you might have been acceptable the previous time, and I thank you very much, sincerely. I will uh, uh, address your questions in a more broad way by trying to discuss what should we call this period, the post-Cold War era. What have we learned in the last year about what is the real nature of this period, uh, and or indeed the last four years? Uh, I don't have a snappy, easy title for the era, but I think that the main characteristics we should recognize uh, are that it is a contested era, it's a fragmented era, and it is an era of disorder. 
Why is it all of those things? I think one big reason for that, and which also emerged very clearly out of the years of the pandemic, it is that it's an era with superpowers, but all of the superpowers are unreliable or inadequate in some way. And indeed, all of the superpowers have emerged from the last four years in some way weakened or perhaps in another way, better way to call it is discredited. What do I mean by that? It's the post, the Cold War was one with two dominant superpowers, but especially the dominant superpower of the United States. In the United States case, we had a, an attempted coup on January the 6th, 2021. We have a sense of unreliability about American politics and therefore about the future leadership of America as a leading democracy. We have all sorts of questions, therefore, about the sustainability of any given American policy line, even though we may agree with it, as of course I do, uh, its present line. If we look at uh, China, China too is in no way dominant. China has emerged from COVID weakened, uh, the presidency discredited, uh, somewhat embattled, and from signing the joint statement a year ago with Russia, announcing a way a contestation for the way in which the world was going to be run, uh, China now does not look one year later as if that contest is moving in its direction. Of course, it may, that doesn't mean it will not do so in the future, but it does not look like a smart thing to have done to have signed that joint statement with Russia a year ago. Russia, it's obvious the state that that superpower is in and has been in for some time. And if we added India to this list, I don't think India looks particularly strong or, or, uh, or uh, influential either. So for most of the countries in the world, uh, the characteristic of the situation is that there are clearly some big elephants uh, in, the, in the world, but none of them is there as the clear leader. And for that reason, I don't agree with the analysis, an analysis that the world is dividing into blocks, unless the definition of the, the largest block is the block of countries that do not want to be in a block, because most countries do not recognize themselves as being in a block uh, in, uh, in the current state of the world, and in fact, that has been, well, that's perhaps a big reason why now this phrase, the global south, has been invented as a way to recognize that actually a very large number of countries, indeed the most, the largest number of countries in the world, are somewhat independent in their thinking, somewhat desirous of following their own self-interests, definitely highly resistant to be for being forced into camps. But that's also the, char the principal characteristic of the Indo-Pacific that um, the number of countries that do not want to be in a block vastly exceeds the number of countries that are in a block uh, currently. So what could lead to a, 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 a world divided into blocks? It would be, I think, a real World War III scenario that would do that. But prior to that, I don't see that happening. So that most countries, and I, in this I include Japan, are seeking to follow strong uh, strategies that recognize this lack of division into blocks, but also seek to deter the contestation of the world from turning into something that's dangerous for them. And for that, I absolutely congratulate uh, Japan for the national security strategy, for taking very clear and decisive uh, moves to increase, improve Japan's contribution to deterrence alongside an important diplomatic effort. I think we'll discuss that diplomatic uh, effort later, but I do think that this, this fragmented era of disorder requires countries like Japan to step forward and make a real contribution to, to preserving peace in the Indo-Pacific, and I congratulate you for doing that. That's my five minutes. Thank you, Bill. especially the point you raised about the structure. 
uh, sort of big elephants power to govern themselves and the weakness of the leadership and the other actors, you know, are growing a kind of multipolar world. And so there is no clear uh, block uh, like the Cold War days, East and West. It's more, you know, complicated. And uh, uh, that the place where uh, what uh, we can do together. So that's the theme perhaps we come at the end of the discussion. But before that, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador Bira Hale Kosikan to speak. I know that uh, you have opinion from the uh, Singaporean point of view, please. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sasai. And thank you for inviting me to participate in person in this global dialogue. Um, I don't represent a Singaporean opinion because I don't have any more official position. My official uh, title is pensioner. Um, but so take my remarks in that spirit. Um, at last year's Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore, Prime Minister Kishida promised a more proactive Japanese approach towards meeting regional and um, international challenges. And I think this was generally uh, favorably received by most countries in our region, uh, certainly including my own. And at the end of last year, we saw a few documents being issued by the Japanese government, which have already been mentioned, which have begun to uh, flesh out this promise of a more, more uh, proactive approach. And that's also to be welcomed. But I am sure Prime Minister Kishida would not mind if I point out that the foundations of this new approach were in fact laid by the late Abe Shinzo. Uh, Mr. Abe's untimely death deprived not just Japan, but the entire region of a very far-sighted leader. I don't think it would be inaccurate to call this new Japanese approach the Abe approach, uh, which replaces the older Yoshida approach, which has been finally laid to rest. Uh, the approach Mr. Abe, Mr. Abe is no longer with us, of course, but his approach will endure because it was a response to structural changes that will define international relations for many, for the foreseeable future. Now, what are these structural uh, conditions? Now, insofar as phrases like the end of the post-Cold War are intended to convey the end of America's unchallenged preeminence, uh, uh, and the time where that seemed that only American ideas of international order were on the table, that was actually a very short period historically, and perhaps an abnormal period. It was only a short, maybe about 20 years, from the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and perhaps the beginning of the global financial crisis in 2008. For most of history, and certainly since 19, 2008, the international order has been contested. Not always very successfully, but contested nonetheless. Um, and for that short period, the preeminence of American power masks a very fundamental reality, that competition, among, competition is an inherent characteristic of any system of sovereign states, and perhaps inherent in human nature. Uh, viewed from this perspective, the war in Ukraine is only unique because it is being fought in the heart of Europe and because nuclear weapon states are directly or indirectly involved. Or to put the point, I don't want to, to underplay, I'm not trying to whitewash what is happening in Ukraine. No, but if I put the point more bluntly, I think you'll get the point more clearly. Uh, the war in Ukraine is unique only because uh, white people are now killing each other with the help of other white people. Uh, violence between states and within states, often the result of great power interventions or between proxies of great powers, is in fact been a constant reality for millions of people in Africa, in the Middle East, in, in much of Latin America. It is not unique. It is only unique because white people are killing white people in Europe. 
And this leads many Western pronouncements on the war in Ukraine to be regarded with some ambivalence, if not downright skepticism, by much of what we now call the Global South. Uh, I think the West underestimates the tenuousness of support for its position on the Ukraine in much of the Global South, uh, including in Southeast Asia, where the position taken by my country, which is a strong support for Ukraine and strong uh, resistance to America, uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, is something of an outlier. It's not the norm. Uh, I don't like the term a new Cold War to describe the situation, and perhaps I'll talk a bit more about that tomorrow rather than today, or we can do it during question time. But I want to make a point. One of the other structural changes in this new era of competition, which is a more normal period of world history, is a change in the way America engages the world. Um, after the collapse of the former Soviet Union, America faces no, no existential external threat. China is a formidable peer competitor, and it's not to be underestimated, but I don't think it poses an existential threat. It is competing with the US within the same system, not trying to replace the system. Uh, Russia is certainly very dangerous, but it's not an existential threat. In fact, even before Putin's monumental miscalculation, the trajectory of, Russian, of Russia over the long term was downwards. And Mr. Putin has only probably accelerated that. Now, without an existential threat after the Cold War, every, the main priority of every, every um, American administration, with the Bush 43 administration as a partial administration, partial exception forced by 9-11, has in fact been domestic. Now, some commentators have called this a retreat from the world. I don't think it is a retreat of the world, but it's certainly a redefinition of how America intends to engage the world. There's really no reason, without an existential external threat, for Americans to pay any price, bear any burden to uphold international order. So it expects much more help from its allies, from its friends, from its partners, to uphold international order. It will still have everybody's back. It has the capabilities that nobody else has, but it demands, expects more help. And that has been the essential approach of Mr. Obama, although he, in his case, he took the form of a greater emphasis on multilateralism. And multilateralism is another way of burden sharing. Mr. Trump made, you know, uh, rather crude demands. And of course, Mr. Biden is much more consultative, and I think we're all grateful for that. But he's not consulting us because he loves our company. He's consulting us to find out what we are prepared to do with him <laughs> to meet the challenges of our time. I think the late Mr. Abe was one of the first leaders in our region to understand this change in American policy, and that explains much of what he did to try to make Japan a more equal partner in the American alliance. And let me conclude very quickly with what I think Japan's role is in this new situation. I think Japan has three fundamental roles. Uh, I agree with what Bill Elmert said about people wanting to create space for themselves in, and maneuver space. Uh, but the fact is, that space can be only created on the basis, on the foundation of balance. And that balance must include the United States in any region. Um, as the premier US ally in this region, Japan's fundamental role is to anchor the US presence here. Secondly, the US is a global power. And as a global power from time to time, it will have responsibilities in other regions. But Japan is a regional power. And with the new capabilities the Japanese government has vowed to build, <laughs> Japan will be a better partner in this region to maintain, to prevent wild fluctuations in the balance when the US has other responsibilities. And thirdly and finally, um, I think Japan, of all the members of G7, understands this region and certainly my own sub-region of Southeast Asia much better than any other G7 members. 
And so we hope that Japan will play a role, and it is a crucial role, in kind of tempering the wilder fight flights uh, that some of the uh, Western G7 members are from time to time subjected to. And that's not a role to be underestimated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Birahali, for making a stimulative and partially uh, um, controversial way of uh, defining the uh, Ukraine war or uh, your, your assessment that either China or Russia would not be an ex existential threat. Uh, at this moment, it could be, but in the future, it uh, continue to be holding on. Uh, let, let us discuss later on. And, and, and next, uh, I have uh, a distinguished guest from China, uh, uh, Dr. Jingin Si. Uh, you, uh, he is a uh, president uh, Tsinghua University Executive Dean, Institute for the Belt and the Road Initiative. Uh, uh, Dr. Xi, you have the floor. You okay. hear me? Okay. okay Please. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, moderator. <coughs> okay. I first, uh, I'd like to first to express my thanks to the organizer of the conference for inviting me to participate in the roundtable. Uh, featuring the strategic annual report uh, 2002, uh, 2022. <clears throat> yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, uh, in the past year, yes, the, wor the world uh, situation has been, has been changing greatly and uh, profoundly, uh, also drastic very drastically. So the so-called yeah, the, the so end of the post-Cold War era and the new Cold War uh, become the very hard term of phrases in media and uh, in uh, academics. Uh, however, I, uh, I, I, I disagree. Uh, I disagree with the term of Cold War to describe any uh, contemporary international relations. I believe that the era of Cold War is over. And it is a, a very painful memory in human history when the absolute uh, confrontation between the two great powers led to a series of historical tragedies. So we should learn from the lessons of history and uh, we should not uh, allow them to repeat again. So, and, and however, we cannot deny that there is a series of a series of Cold War thinking in international relations today. And this kind of thinking is, uh, and this kind of thinking significantly explains why international community nowadays is in chaos. Acts of uh, blame, uh, opportunism, and uh, zero sum games are some of the expressions of the Cold War thinking which also explains the current uh, international disorder. Uh, in addition, I particularly, I, I particularly opposed uh, uh, to describe the relationship between China and USA as a Cold War. It is no secret that the Ukraine crisis has uh, uh, further exaggerated uh, the relationship between, between China and US. Still, we can see, we should see that uh, with the outbreak of the crisis, uh, both sides have maintained uh, various uh, channels for dialogues and communications and, exchange, and exchanged views on a series of sig significant international issues. So these dialogues and the communications uh, enhance the mutual understanding while controlling the disagreements and reducing the strategic misjudgments that may, de that may lead to tragedies. In particular, leaders from both sides have repeatedly emphasized that, we, that they do not want uh, conflict uh, or new Cold War between the two countries. I believe that uh, through dialogues and uh, stable bilateral relations, China-USA 
uh, China and the U.S. could uh, gradually reduce friction, uh, friction and uh, differences and to contribute to the world peace and development. Uh, to, in reality, yeah, as we know, this is uh, uh, an era of globalization, although there is some, uh, yes, uh, some uh, movement against yeah, the globalization, but it is a fact. And uh, all the countries, especially the major countries, are uh, dependent on each other. Yeah, They uh, coexist to accept uh, the international system. So the two camps in the Cold War does not exist, just uh, uh, as the previous speakers mentioned that uh, uh, even uh, <laughs> uh, that there is no leaders, yeah, there are no leaders. Yeah, apart from uh, uh, apart from that, China is uh, continuing the communication uh, with USA, and China uh, uh, basically has a very normal relations, a uh, dialogue relations uh, with uh, Americans partner, uh, Americans allies like European country. You know, we have a very uh, normal channels uh, with uh, uh, with European Union. And in addition, <coughs> and uh, uh, as with to the next, uh, uh, the ne uh, the, another uh, question I think is that uh, what's the the future uh, focus or uh, focus? I think after the crisis, I believe that uh, the Indo-Pacific region will become the new focal point. The main reason, the main reason for this future focal point is the changing relation between major powers. First is a more sensitive relationship between China and USA, as I mentioned uh, in the first question, although I disagree with the term uh, new code. But the, Euro, the, the Ukraine crisis, no doubt, increased the tension between China and US, and the mutual distrust has intensified. The Indo-Pacific region as the only geopolitical contact point of China and US would naturally become the next uh, focal point. The secondly is the Russia's, strategy, Russia's strategic shift eastward. Uh, yeah. As we know, in 2022, uh, uh, Putin, uh, Russian President Putin said at the Eastern Economic Forum that a powerful political and economic center is forming in the Asia Pacific, leading to the breaking of the hegemony in the unipolar world and moving toward a multipolar world. So the Ukraine crisis has almost halted, stopped all Russia's economic ties with the EU. Therefore, Russia has been forced to shift its main economic relations to Asia for the purpose of development. And the third is a gradual strengthening of the EU's coordination with the US on Indo-Pacific strategy uh, during the Ukraine crisis, the strategic coordination between EU and US have gradually increased as EU has uh, promoted its strategic coordination uh, with US on Pacific strategy. I know EU issued its uh, Indo-Pacific strategy paper. This will accelerate accept the specific implementation of the Indo-Pacific strategy. So lastly, yeah, yeah, last means firstly is the Cold War thinking leads to the rise of confrontational behaviors, behavior in certain countries. And in certain countries, the Ukraine crisis has led to an increase in Cold War sentiment. They hope to enhance security through a group or alliance or allies confrontation with a zero-sum game. Uh, facing the so-called security threats, some developing countries in the Indo-Pacific areas have to choose to cooperate with major powers or have to take the sides, and even the military groups uh, with the aim to get stronger security guarantees. So anyway, I think uh, uh, in future, uh, there is a, uh, this is a very, very complex line as the previous years. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Prof Professor C, uh, especially uh, 
uh, for making uh, kind, I don't say rosy, but uh, pretty uh, positive and, and optimistic uh, uh, status of the relationship between the United States and, and, and China. And uh, you talked a bit about uh, uh, Cold War rhetorics, and uh, uh, that shouldn't be in the way of uh, and making constructive relationship uh, between the two major powers. I, uh, possibly the other participants would have some uh, assessment on that. But, uh, uh, and also I'm very much interested in, in listening to uh, uh, who are making a confrontational uh, approach or remarks. I think that, that there could be some difference of perception which side is making more confrontational approach or thought. But uh, let me just turn to uh, Kokubu Sensei. And uh, Kokubu Sensei is a, a professor emeritus of Keio University, as, as all of you know. Uh, Kokubu Sensei, please. You have uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me speak in Japanese. Yeah. Now, I thank you for waiting. Uh, what uh, is said to be merging? is a new Cold War, how to view that? Well, uh, to me, China and Russia uh, have a, a tactical relationship in their policy toward the US. It is not a strategic relationship that the China and Russia have. China has never been uh, inclined toward Russia and perhaps uh, w China will never be inclined toward China. Russia's economy is one-tenth one of that of China. And uh, after Ukraine, I believe that uh, there's going to be a decline, decline in the uh, position of Russia. And uh, I don't think uh, uh, we have reached a block confrontation of democracy versus authoritarianism because the, uh, the authoritarian bloc has not uh, emerged. And the uh, Sino-centered political camp, it's not there. Well, it's uh, basically an economic relationship, and China itself is not really offering new values. So uh, in essence, what uh, is said to be emerging right now with respect to the new Cold War, essentially it's a China-US confrontation. So what is uh, happening? The, uh, Cold War between uh, China and the US and the Cold War between the US and Soviet Union. What are some of the similarities? What are some of the differences? When it comes to differences, there is no nuclear parity that uh, has come to the fore. And also, global economy, under global economy, there is uh, interdependence. And also, uh, we have not reached a point where we can say there is a cap camp confrontation. And also domestically, either in China or the US, they have many, many domestic problems. So uh, Global South is existent within their own countries. However, there are similarities as well. And that is, in the end, it is a power competition based on the premise of systemic differences. It is a power uh, competition competition over power. So if uh, there is a, a US-China Cold War, of course, it may be around the technological hegemony, but uh, essentially, it is uh, a Taiwan issue. So what to make of a Taiwan issue? The Biden administration, more or less, is oriented toward dialogue, it is true, but uh, uh, given the uh, public sentiment in the United States and uh, Congress in the United States, there's a very strong, or increasingly strong anti-China sentiment. That is failure of engagement. Now, uh, engagement uh, uh, exists, well, uh, consisted of uh, expectation on China. China becoming a society like the US, that was an expectation, but uh, uh, people feel betrayed by China, it didn't happen. Well, uh, I think Japanese people have a different view on this. So Taiwan itself, 
What about it? Now, to the extent we see, the uh, domestic move is rather uh, well toward uh, maintaining the status quo. The, uh, well, the national, well, Kuomintang National Party uh, sort of uh, collapsed, but now it's regaining strength. And uh, they are thinking about uh, cooperation with China. So the current uh, Taiwan issue is not uh, really the issue of uh, Sino-Taiwan relations, but it's uh, the core issue of the U.S.-China relations. So for China, what are the benefits of uh, unification of Taiwan? I think uh, there are benefits, but uh, there may be disadvantages as well. Benefits is the expansion of uh, Xi Jinping's prestige and also territorial expansion, but disadvantages would include even Tibet and Uyghur. Well, I have uh, uh, given difficulties to uh, the Chinese administration, but uh, the Taiwan is across the sea, and uh, control of uh, uh, Taiwan would mean added uh, instability to China, and uh, the greatest uh, uh, goal of uh, the Chinese Com Communist Party has been the unification of Taiwan, but uh, with the unification, it will no longer be there. So the greatest benefit for China is not uh, the direct use of force. Uh, I think uh, that's their realistic position. So they should uh, uh, well use time and use uh, a variety of uh, means and, uh, uh, well, the, uh, peaceful means. Of course, they may use uh, a force realistically. However, if a situation emerges in which Taiwan does not completely return to China, if this kind of a situation emerges, then there's a possibility that uh, uh, China may use uh, a force. So what is the position of Japan against this uh, backdrop? We heard uh, Prime Minister Kishida's remarks earlier on. The Ukrainian issue in East Asia uh, might uh, bring about uh, some sort of a crisis. Uh, that kind of a similarity is being felt. And uh, well, this has not just started with the Kishida administration, but uh, from Abe administration, I think uh, there has been a major change of uh, uh, Japan's security policy. Well, the issue surrounding North Korea, of course, uh, uh, they rattle us every day. And also the China's concern. And at the same time, the uh, decisive factor was uh, the Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. So dependence on the U.S., well, as was mentioned before, well, the U.S. has a very serious domestic issues. So self-help is needed. Uh, Japan, I think, has recognized the importance of self-help. And the Abe administration has been working on the national security uh, strategy that included the establishment of National Security Bureau and the establishment of collective self-defense. For Japanese security policy, this was a uh, a uh, well, revolutionary change, uh, supporting the uh, allies uh, based upon the uh, UN Charter is now a possibility, and that happened in 2015. And uh, Indo-Pacific, well, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific concept has uh, been put forth by the admi Abe administration. Against this backdrop, Kishida administration has uh, passed three security documents that happened in December last year, 2022. And uh, I think there are two important points, needless to say. Defense spending would be a uh, reason to 2% of GDP on par with NATO countries. And at the same time, the other point is uh, counterattack capability. Well, before, uh, Japan has had uh, a defense-only posture, but uh, it is now going beyond that and has uh, decided to uh, uh, foster counterattack capability. And I was in Europe uh, just the other day, and uh, about, so Japan now has a defense spending uh, policy just like NATO. So I really didn't uh, uh, NATO uh, questioning Japan's uh, policy. So this passed uh, in Japan without much opposition from the public. This is a major point because security is not uh, for free. 
this kind of awareness is now uh, taking root uh, among the Japanese people. So uh, people think that uh, Japan should have a deterrence of a normal nation. However, uh, there are a lot of hurdles as well, which I have to say, needless to say. Uh, so where uh, should we get the money? Financial resources is one issue. And with declining birth rate, uh, the security, for example, self-defense forces may have a, a smaller number of people. Uh, so how to recruit uh, the members of uh, self-defense forces? And also, Japan has had uh, no counter-attack capability. That is, uh, attack capability. So at what speed, at what scale, how can this be realized? Uh, that's uh, uh, yet to be seen. And also, uh, in the uh, three security documents, what is uh, emphasized is cyber and other advanced technologies. Uh, these would be major challenges for Japan. However, uh, lastly, I would like to add uh, one other thing, and that is uh, Japan should not just have a deterrence capability. Deterrence uh, capability is, is very, very important, but uh, there's another thing that Japan should do, and that is uh, diplomatic efforts to avoid uh, contingencies. How should uh, Japan foster diplomatic uh, capability? On this point, well, of course, because we had the corona, uh, novel corona uh, pandemic, it's very difficult to have a dialogue with China. Japanese uh, scholars uh, hesitate to go to China because uh, many people think that uh, there's a possibility for them to be arrested. So how can we change the situation, uh, overcome this situation? Dialogue is very necessary. Thank you. Kokomu uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, uh, you said that uh, uh, the uh, essence of so-called, I would say, so-called Cold War uh, is Sino-American confrontation. And the focus of that is Taiwan. Uh, China is still hoping for the peaceful solutions. Uh, yeah, use of the force is the last resort as, uh, you know, uh, Xi Jinping said before. Right. I hope that will be the case. But uh, you also pointed out that uh, Japan's effort uh, to step up its defense is uh, to effort to become more normal nations. That was debated more than two decades ago. We remember the debates, but that's still over or <laughs> still to come. I don't know. But, uh, and also importantly, you talked about the importance of dialogue. I think for that, everyone agreed. But with that, I want to ask uh, every participant to say something about what the others said, or they, if there is something you want to say more about what you're trying to say. You want? Yes, please, Lisa. Thank you. Um, yes, I think uh, uh, Professor King said something very uh, important. Uh, when he indicated that the UK Ukraine crisis has actually exaggerated um, the U.S.-China uh, problems or increased tension uh, between U.S. and China. Um, I, I agree with that. And, but I also think that um, it's contributed to other countries, including European nations, um, to being concerned about deterrence globally, because there's a sense that we failed to deter Russia from invading Ukraine. And so we don't want deterrence to fail anywhere else, because you know now we've seen a horrific grinding war, civilians uh, getting killed. Uh, you had uh, President Putin doing nuclear saber rattling uh, last year. Uh, so, you know, I think nobody wants to see uh, this happen again. And so deterrence has become more important and more urgent, I think, for many countries, not only the U.S., but European nations. You could even argue that nations... Uh, that is the, why Japan's national security strategy, national defense strategy uh, was uh, much more uh, serious and uh, showed a commitment to increasing its defense budget. 
um, because of this whole idea that because of what we've seen with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we just can't afford to not have deterrence work um, in other areas. And I, I would just want to comment um, on Ambassador uh, Kosikan's remarks about the um, Russia not being an existential threat. Well, I certainly think the Ukrainians see Russia as an existential threat, but put the, putting that aside, um, I would come back to uh, the idea that we have seen uh, very uh, dangerous behavior, very irresponsible behavior from President Putin, particularly around the nuclear weapons issue, that uh, if it's not an existential threat, it certainly is a threat that concerns the global community. Um, so I would just uh, note that. Um, let me just leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, do you want to say anything about it? Uh, well, I'll only, I mean, I will follow on that point about what's an ex existential threat, because I think it's an important point that Bila, my friend Bilahari has raised. Um, one part of that, of that question is, well, you, you have, when you think about your ex existence, you should be thinking about future existential threats, uh, and clearly behind the US-China contestation, I think there is some sense that uh, China could potentially be an existential threat to the US, not because uh, it's expect any imminent attack on the American mainland is conceived, but rather that um, a world dominated by China, which inclu would include uh, a, a total strategic hold on the Western Pacific, could be not just damaging for American interests, but potentially you know, a big threat to, to America's economy, to America's society, and in the case of, as it were, a contest over that, an equal China would be a China that could, was capable of offering an existential threat to America. But it's clear that China is not an equal country, certainly not in nuclear terms, far from it. China has a minimum deterrence policy, um, and so is way, way different and that is not the case now, but I think that in, in str grand strategy terms, it's not inappropriate to, to think ahead. But as far as Russia is concerned, um, I think European countries definitely see Russia as an existential threat. There's a clear sense that, as it were, that what, what President Putin is, is doing is attempting to recreate the Russian Empire. Um, his, designs on Ukraine are imperial. Uh, his designs, therefore, also, according to the things he's written and, and said, uh, extend to other former parts of the Soviet Union, former parts of the Russian Empire, which certainly include the Baltic states, which Poland has a reasonable expectation to believe that that extends to large parts of Poland, possibly all of Poland. So, and, and of course, the weakness of Russia is precisely a reason also to fear that because out of the weakness must, can come an ambition to try to compensate for that weakness by seizing other countries. So I don't think it's unreasonable to see Russia as an existential threat to Europe and therefore to NATO. I do agree that it's probably not an existential threat to mainland United States. Um, so I, so I, would, I, would, I, would, I would dis dis disagree with that point. Um, I think on Taiwan, the only thing I'd add to what, to, to what has been said uh, is that really the right approach to Taiwan is not to try to predict what any party is cons going to do, and that would include, crucially, Taiwanese politics, but also American politics, which is a very crucial and unpredictable variable, or uh, the, the politics and the policy of the, of the leadership in China but rather to prepare uh, and to seek to deter um, a military conflict that, uh, that were it to happen, would be capable of escalating into, into a, even a nuclear conflict. Um, so and I don't think there's any sense in trying to say, well, it's not going this direction this year, and therefore we shouldn't do such and such. I think it's a, it's a matter of preparation, and therefore extended deterrence is the right approach. Thank you, uh, Peter Harrison. 
You want to yeah, respond? I think I think we are all talking about the same thing from different from different ang ang from different angles. I didn't say I. No, Russia is certainly an existential threat to Ukraine. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Russia may be an existential threat to Europe, but that's very largely Europe's fault for not um, for not preparing itself to deter Russia. It's incapable of deterring Russia. Uh, it may be develop that capability, but it will take some time. Uh, but Russia is certainly not an existential threat to the United States in the sense that the Soviet Union was <laughs> an existential threat to the United States. And that's not merely a matter of nuclear capability or military capability. It is something more profound. Uh, and that also uh, enables me to explain something else. Uh, Professor Xi doesn't like the term new Cold War to describe US-China relations. Neither do I like that term, but I think, I suspect for completely different reasons from Professor Xi, <laughs> right? Now, the US and the Soviet Union led two very different systems, and their contest was between these two systems to see which would replace the other. Now, that is what I mean by an existential threat, right? The nuclear capability, the military capability, these are means to this bigger issue. But it's been a damn long time since anybody could really seriously hope or fear that communism is going to replace capitalism. The US and China are both, for all their differences, and their differences are real, uh, are both vital, irreplaceable parts of one single global system, and they are connected to each other and to the rest of us by a historically new phenomenon. And that historically new phenomenon are supply chains of a density, of a complexity, of a scope that have never been seen before in history. And, and while those, that web is the new factor, so they compete within a system, and competition within a system is by definition not existential. It can be very dangerous. It has to be dealt with, whether by diplomacy or deterrence, but it's not existential. Um, I don't think this web is going to bifurcate completely into two separate systems, right? After, uh, you know, China is certainly a revanchist power. It's revanchist in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, in the Himalayas. But that's a bit different from saying it's a revisionist power. That's maybe overstating the case, or to call it, I think as the EU does, a systemic competitor. That's overstating the case. Doesn't mean it's not a challenge that needs to be met but I think we should understand the challenge accurately. One last point. Um, when you are dealing, when the US deals with China or Russia, because it is no longer dealing with an existential threat, the US is moving throughout the world to a different kind of strategic posture. 50 years ago or more, the US made a terrible mistake in Vietnam and as part of its correcting, of correcting its mistake, it moved from a posture of direct intervention to one of being offshore balancer. And it has been pretty consistent for half a century uh, as offshore balancer. And I keep reminding people who say America is not reliable. It is not reliable in many ways, but it has been pretty consistent in East Asia as the offshore balancer for half a century. 20 years ago, the US made a dreadful mistake in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as part of correcting that mistake, I believe a similar move to being from direct intervention to being offshore balancer is happening in the Middle East too. The US Fifth Fleet is still in Bahrain. The US Air Force is still in the UAE and Qatar. And the US has the capacity, if it feels it's worth its while, to reach out and kill bad guys in the Middle East from a distance, if it feels it's worth its while. But it's not, I think, going to get involved directly in the way it did 20 years ago, and fought 20 years ago. I believe sooner or later, a similar move is going to happen in Europe. Ukraine will delay, it, but it's not going to divert that move. And so that is why the US demands more of its friends, its allies, and its things to help it in this posture. And that is a very fundamental change, which I don't think Mr. Abe, the late Mr. Abe, steadily understood that. Japan has understood it now. Uh, in our region, my region, ASEAN countries, I don't think ASEAN either as an organization or some major countries in ASEAN have yet sufficiently understood it. And I'm not sure the Europeans 
perhaps I was still grasping at it. I'll stop here. Well, thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, <laughs> Birahali Koshikana. On this issue of uh, whether Russia or China uh, could be an existential threat to the United States, uh, you might be right, but could it be an existential threat to the others around it? That's something else. Of I think. course, of course. We have to do so our own, take the, our own precautions uh, yeah, yeah. collectively and yeah. singly. <laughs> and also the time frame we are talking about. In the future, say, for example, uh, China is becoming a big nuclear power compar comparable to the United States. Then people argue that uh, on the conventional side, there could be some battle going on. And, and those assumptions, do you think that could be wrong or right? No, I think time frame is very important factor, but it works both ways. Huh? I think you know my views, Ambassador Sasai. I think it is almost inevitable that extended deterrence in East Asia is going to be eroded over time. And countries in East Asia will do what Britain and France did many, many decades ago. I think it's already been openly debated in Korea. <laughs> right? So well, I may be right, I may be wrong. That's one issue. But I think it's something to think about. But there's another point. point. By some estimates, by the turn of the century, 2,100, China will be half its size in population. What the implications of that are, nobody knows. <laughs> really? But something to think about. We have all been very concerned about the implications of a rising China. I think it's time to spare some time to think of terms, and think in terms of whether we are going to see peak China and a frust therefore a frustrated China. And perhaps dealing with a frustrated China is going to be far more difficult than dealing with a rising China. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Xi. Uh, perhaps uh, you might mm. say something okay, about thank it. You. But uh, thank before, you. Uh, I, before you speak, uh, I want to listen here from you about the Japanese uh, uh, national security and defense, uh, defense effort these days. Does that concern Chinese people or government, or it's nothing, uh, small things, compared to what China has been doing some years? What's your view? Yeah, okay. uh, as a matter of fact, I, uh, uh, I don't want to make much uh, comment on this issue because I'm, uh, I'm not an expert uh, so, uh, of this area. Uh, from the Chinese people, so, uh, so we hope that uh, Japan will be remain to keep its uh, peaceful policy after the World War II. And uh, so, uh, if you try to increase the the the, the expenditure of the uh, on, on the defense, yeah, it, 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 it increase uh, the. Uh, spending on on defense, maybe or, or I think will uh, cause some concern for the ordinary Chinese people. You, you know, because uh, for Chinese people, we'll have the memory of the uh, before uh, 19, uh, 19, 1945. Yeah, so uh, I think this is uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, from ordinary Chinese people, we have, will have this uh, uh, feeling. So in terms of other points, I think uh, we talk a lot about uh, China is an uh, essential uh, threat. Huh? I think maybe this is the, uh, really, we, we, even Chinese government or scholar, we, we, we would like to use the word a misperception of China. So uh, uh, just uh, some scholars said that uh, like USA, China, China has a lot of internal issues. The main uh, uh, the main goal, the main task for China is try to develop. So, and also from its history, uh, China has no the history of expand expanding. Uh, even the latest uh, 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 Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, 28th uh, Congress in this document also emphasized again that uh, we we are not uh, uh, we are not to to be a hegemony. Yeah. So from uh, from Mao uh, from Mao Zedong to Deng and uh, to current uh, the government, uh, we we will try to emphasize the the peaceful policy. Uh, even the the defense policy is also the 
uh, prevention, uh, preventive uh, the policy. So, uh, and the document emphasized over and over again, uh, no matter how China developed in the uh, in future, China will never to be a hegemony, never to expand. I think this is uh, the uh, Chinese uh, policy, yeah, always the policy. So uh, maybe some uh, media or some newspaper, even some scholars uh, said uh, something that uh, we should try to be powerful or we should try uh, to be as powerful as the USA. That's just uh, 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 one of the voice of the, uh, of the civil, uh, civil voice, not uh, the government to policy. And also, <laughs> in, in terms of the Taiwan issue, uh, just uh, uh, Professor Kokuban yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, emphasized that uh, Chinese policy on Taiwan is, is always the peaceful, peaceful unification. So the, and the military, yeah, military force is the last result uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to prevent or to stop the uh, secession of the Taiwan from mainland China. So uh, I, this is, I, I, I agree with this point. And also in future, I think we should uh, not try to distinguish uh, uh, democracy or author authoritarian regimes. So, uh, you know, uh, even in the, and the world is a very divisive world. So we should try, we should judge uh, its policy from its democracy or uh, authority. So, I I I, I think the, you, 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 for a long time, uh, Chinese uh, Chinese government emphasized over again. We should try to go go beyond the, the ideology or even the system. We should try to cooperate, to dialogue, and more cooperate, no more cooperate, more dialogue, uh, rather than confrontation. I think this is the. Uh, uh, as intellectual, as uh, scholars, as scholars, we should try to do to contribute uh, to the uh, world peace, uh, world development. I think this is uh, what we should do. Okay, thank you. Uh, as, uh, thank you, uh, Professor C. Kokubu Sensei. Perhaps we, uh, you might say something. Uh, yes. Uh, well. Uh, well, I'm. I'm a. China specialist for many years, and then, uh, well, we expected that China could be probably this kind of country, probably, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we expected. But uh, unfortunately, China's uh, path is uh, something very, I say, you know, the unexpected way, you know, is moving. Uh, well, we expected the more, I, I say, the more open and uh, probably more liberated kind of country China could be in the future. Uh, probably that was the China, U.S.'s engagement policy too, probably, and something like a U.S. society China could be in the future. But of course it failed. But China's, uh, you know, we expected, uh, you know, that in some ways, you know, probably this, uh, you know, dialogue is now probably reported to Chinese top leaders probably. So that is, you know, I, I would like to, you know, directly send a message to Chinese leaders. So uh, probably we, we guessed. In, in that way, I think, uh, you know, China is moving, the worst scenario is moving in, in some ways, I say. You know, we expected more, <laughs> as I said. So why? Uh, of course, the domestic reasons, probably. But at the same time, now China's military expenditure, you know, he said that, uh, well, China never, uh, you know, engaged in a hegemonic way or something. But uh, if you look at the reality, not, uh, you know, the words, if you look at the, that reality, you know, China is really, I say, expanding in the military and uh, the public security expenditure. That's great, you know, it's uh, you know, amazing. Uh, almost uh, Japan's now the big defense budget probably six, seven more times, I think. You know, the China is really, you know, moving <laughs> that way. Now, of course, 
you know, you say, you may say that this is a very much a domestic reason, but, uh, you know, the hegemony means, well, you may say, but, uh, you know, outsiders, you know, looking at China, that is different view, of course, we have. That is, <laughs> look like a hegemonic way, you know, China is moving. So we really concerning uh, that kind of things. So, but, but I say, uh, China has something, uh, I say, well, it's, it's very difficult for China to change the domestic politics, of course, probably. But uh, if you think of a foreign policy, China may change some, some points. For example, the, the present Ukraine issues, China can play something more intermediary role. And at the same time, the North Korean issues, well, China, well North Korea doesn't have any uh, nuclear test yet, but probably China, the pressure, we're not, we're not sure, but the probably more North Korea is considering about uh, the China's response, particularly China, US-China relations probably. So in that sense, the Russia's uh, influence is so weakening probably to the North Korea too. So in that sense, I think uh, China may have some uh, important role for you know, the uh, kind of an intermediary role. So this, this kind of things, foreign policy, more I say, more you know, uh, while looking uh, in the more peaceful ways, China can may play a role. So I would like to send a message to the top leaders in China. Thank you for sending the message. Uh, I uh, uh, taking this occasion, I'd like to ask you or one question, uh, Kokubu Sensei. You said that the Sino Russian relationship at this moment is uh, still a tactical relationship, not necessarily strategic. You said it, right? But uh, what happens if uh, Russia will be successful in fighting I over Ukraine issue? Russia seems to be here. Uh, I hope that would not be the case, of course. But uh, if Russia would uh, be confident about, uh, about the way they do. And if China would think that, uh, well, that the way uh, everybody else could do, including China. In that case, don't you think that uh, there could be more strategic relationship to be developed? That's also uh, the, uh, affected by Sino-American relationship at the time, of course. But what you're thinking, all this triangular relationship? Well, that's, uh, you know, China's uh, the foreign policy is based on basically not by ideology or not by, the, the very simply I say, the power politics. So if, uh, the, you know, the, in the Ukrainian uh, issues, the Russians are you know, more, I say, the, you know, the positively moving. I think it's, uh, of course, China is moving on that way, that way. Of course, uh, you know, always making balance. So I think uh, always moving by, move by, by interest, national interest, that's all. So I think, uh, you know, the, the so far, I say, the China-Russia relations is, I say something, I say, very intermediary. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, the ambiguous in some ways. Well, you know, China is not fully supporting the Russia. That's my, you know, observation. Thank you. Anybody else uh, uh, want to speak before moving to the floor and audience? Okay, then I, 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 I'd like to open the floor uh, to the uh, audience, and uh, including uh, those online. No? Anybody? Please raise your hands. Uh, I see uh, Ambassador Nogami thinking deep, <laughs> sitting there. So perhaps uh, you have something to say and ask. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, I have uh, one question to uh, uh, Lisa. One of the largest concerns for the uh, countries, the allies of the United States, uh, perhaps not for the uh, countries in adversarial uh, relations, but uh, for the allies, friends and allies of the United States, is uh, instability and the lack of uh, sort of, well, the future of the U.S. domestic politics. The, uh, this, the, I think this is going to be the uh, lasting concern on the part of the uh, friends of the United States. But what uh, is the United States going to do about it? Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I would point to the midterm elections and how those turned out. Uh, because I think what the result of the midterm elections showed was that uh, many of the, the extreme candidates um, and several that um, former President Trump had backed uh, did not win. Uh, and so I think that, that we, uh, the midterm elections in the United States did represent a, uh, a little bit of a centering of the uh, political discourse in the United States. Um, I will admit that uh, it's been a very polarized uh, few years uh, in U.S. politics, and I understand that that has been unsettling for our allies and partners. Um, but I, you know, I would just point to the results of the midterms and and what happened there um, as an indication that uh, the U.S. political system is is starting to um, normalize or equalize. Um, uh, to some degree. So, um, and I also think uh, we've seen a, a great deal of effort going into rebuilding alliances and partnerships over the last few years. And I think that's been quite evident. And, you know, the U.S. welcomes the kind of leadership that uh, we're seeing from Japan, um, these new national security documents that have come out um, are showing that Japan is, um, you know, taking a leadership role and uh, the United States certainly welcomes that. And the United States is working with many allies and partners. We haven't talked about the Quad, but that's an important economic, technology, uh, partnership. Um, it's not a, an alliance. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's not an Asian NATO, um, as some have raised. Um, but it is an important grouping of four major democratic powers um, who are interested in seeing um, the region uh, continue to be free and open with, you know, free and open seaways, airways, uh, free trade. Um, so I, I think that the U.S. Um, has definitely shown that it relies on ally, allies and partners. It uh, consults with allies and partners. Um, it's not, you know, running around taking unilateral actions. Um, and so I think, you know, there should be grounds for confidence in the United States. Um, uh, the, you know, certainly no democracy is a perfect democracy. And, uh, but I think the important thing is that um, we learn from mistakes and we continue to put, you know, the people first and, uh, you know, continue to, to keep refining and making more perfect um, our democratic systems. And we deeply appreciate the kind of friendship um, and confidence that we have had uh, with Japan, with an ally like Japan. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lisa. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, hi, Dan Snyder from Stanford University. Um, Ambassador Sasai sort of raised this question, what happens if Russia wins, if you will, the war? Let me reverse that question. What happens if Russia loses? And I'm particularly interested in the implications for China uh, and for this region. If we have a situation, uh, I, I think it seems to me the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party is poised the rather important moment of decision about whether they're going to try and rescue uh, Mr. Putin from his strategic disaster or abandon him. And I sense that uh, Secretary Blinken was in some sense posing that question directly or indirectly to Wang Yi in, in Munich by raising these uh, warnings about the possibility of China supplying uh, lethal assistance to Russia at this point. And I wonder what the panelists think, including our colleague in Beijing, uh, about what the implications are. I mean, how China itself thinks about this decision point. What's at stake for China? And what the implications are, as I said, if uh, things, if the Russians lose. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a pretty tough question there. Uh, Professor C, uh, uh, you want to respond anyway? Before you do, uh, perhaps some of you might have read uh, this article in the recent uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, Foreign Affairs Journal. Uh, there was an article about the uh, scenario. That scenario is that uh, Russia is, uh, is losing and disintegrated and the confusions and uh, that implication could be over Caucasus and other smaller uh, countries around it. And then there will be power vacuum, and then the China will go into the power vacuum. That's uh, some of the things that are written by this uh, author. But uh, without coming into that one, I'd like to uh, ask uh, the, uh, the Dr. C uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. to respond, if you could. Uh, I think this is a very, very challenging question for me. I'm not a policymaker. I don't know whether the government has any preparatory plan for not of uh, the war. So, but I, I just, I'd like to, to make comment because uh, some of you uh, mentioned the, 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 the relation between China and Russia. So we can no limits uh, the partnership. I think this is a, a very uh, <laughs> great word. <laughs> to express the relation, just the close relation. You know, uh, uh, yeah, China, uh, Chinese, uh, Ch Chinese people are very, it, it is a very, uh, how to say, a passion, it is a zhong gan qing, means very, pay much more attention to the friendship uh, between one country and another country. So uh, Russia is, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, since the yeah, yeah, 1990s, Russia uh, has est established a, a collaborative relationship with China. So, uh, and Russia uh, for long for long time, Russia is a threat. Uh, uh, Soviet Union is a threat uh, to 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 China, especially the China and the Soviet Union's uh, yes uh, split up. Yes. So, uh, after the uh, uh, Soviet uh, the breakdown of the Soviet Union, the Russia yeah. Uh, uh, also try to uh, uh, value the relation between China, between China and and uh, and, Ru uh, and Russia. So uh, this is the we should try to know the history uh, of the two countries. So and also China has uh, many partners with all the important countries and uh, uh, the 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 cooperative countries. So. Uh, just like uh, the in 2014, uh, when the uh, when Soviet Union uh, annexed the Crimea, so this is the uh, question uh, repeated, repeated over and over again. How what does Chinese attitude or position to this? So uh, I, I think that we should try. We should try to have a very normal relations with the European Unions. And also, we should try to have normal relations with uh, 
uh, Russia, uh, just like we, sh we, we should have a, a, a very normal relations, cooperative relations with the USA. So we are very equal. We, so the China and Russia relation is not targeted uh, the third party. Oh, this is the, what the Chinese government uh, uh, emphasized over and over again. So I don't think uh, 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 China is uh, very, very supportive of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So. Uh, or, or we, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, Chinese culture. We have a means, 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 face culture. We, 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 we are not uh, even, uh, even uh, uh, ordinary pe people to people. We are not uh, criticize any uh, the third party or any of your friends. Even if he made some mistakes, uh, we will not criticize this. I, I think this is culture, uh, very uh, face. I means, yeah, I means. So. Uh, we do not uh, agree uh, as a person. I, I, I do not agree with Russia's policy. But uh, 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 Chinese government not, does not support the Russia's uh, in any way. Even I think the, for the USA, it uh, knows very clearly. And also the European countries also know clearly. Even the, uh, the Chinese. Uh, uh, the, the, the high official of Wang Yi, yeah, who is uh, in charge of foreign aff international foreign affairs. So he, when he, now he's in the visit, he, he was in Europe, he's trying to negotiate uh, yeah, between Russia and, uh, uh, and the Ukraine, uh, try to, uh, to, be, to, to play its role as a negotiator. So uh, uh, I think the, prob the, the main issue is try to, uh, to stop the war and stop the killing. Yeah, I think this is the Chinese government's stance. Yeah, very, very firmly. Thank you. Bill? <laughs> uh, well, sure, I'll answer uh, in a couple of ways. I mean, the first is that I, I'm interested by uh, our Chinese colleagues' uh, view, but it's, a, it's somewhat in contradiction to the joint statement between Russia and China on February the 4th, uh, 2022, which did appear to be very clearly and directly attacking, criticizing, uh, condemning certain other countries. Uh, the language, uh, it's true that the main translation of this document has come from the Kremlin, so perhaps Russia is, is, uh, should be blamed for, for uh, distorting the language in your view, but it seemed very, very clearly um, a statement of condemnation, criticism, uh, uh, of, uh, of other countries and even the way they govern themselves, but of course, particularly the way they govern the world. But coming to Dan, Dan Snyder's question, um, I think it clearly depends on how Russia loses the war, but uh, my guess is that, that actually um, it won't be very important to China if Russia loses the war in the following sense that it, this isn't a strategic alliance in which Russia is a crucial part of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of Chinese strategy, uh, and therefore the loss of, of, as it were, of that partner would not be so important. Second reason I say that, obviously it depends on how chaotic and, and, uh, and uh, de unstable a, a, a defeated Russia would be, but I suspect that it wouldn't make a fundamental difference to China's calculation of its national interests. And thirdly, the main thing, if I was Chinese pol political leaders, and I'm glad I'm not, but if I was, that I'm looking at in the war in Ukraine, I think, is the impact that the war has on the willingness of the West to like, exhaust themselves by involvement in other, in other, in other conflicts. Um, and so if, like a victorious West is not a very attractive outcome for, for China. But a West that might be, for a time, exhausted by the support for the Ukraine, even if a successful one, could produce a different, cal and, a, and a West, therefore, that goes somewhat in the direction that uh, Bill Ahari is saying, towards, back towards a more hands-off position, might actually be one that China would welcome, see as some provider of opportunities, some openness, and so forth, either for dialogue or for Chinese um, interventionism of its own. So I think it's, a, it's an ambiguous picture. And I think if you were looking at China's interests, you have to, 
I, don't, I think it's a mistake we, which we often, certainly in Europe, make of trying to think of it as simply a question of is this a successful war or not and what does this mean for another country that might be thinking of using military force, but rather it's a power balance question that comes out of this for China um, and a question of what it, where this war leaves the powers and where they stand. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, any other? Yes, please. At the end of the door. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Mandel. I'm a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow and a Visiting Research Fellow at JIA. Um, I want to first take exception and push back on the idea that neither China nor Russia is an existential threat, given that Russia is controlled by someone who has his finger on many nuclear weapons and described the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, while China is, among other things, uh, the largest greenhouse gas emitter and tying the globe into reliance on coal through the creation or through the funding and construction of coal power plants throughout Africa and elsewhere on the Belt and Road Initiative, um, neither is working within the, the existing system. Both of them are seen to be trying to create their own systems, alternative systems. So I would say both are very easily seen as existential threats. But what I want to ask about is dialogue. And there's been a lot of emphasis on the need to have continued dialogue and diplomacy and engage. Have, but I have two questions. One, how do you have that dialogue when you're not speaking the same language? When you can't agree on the same facts, whether something is a war or a special police operation or you know, different perspectives. And then what happens when dialogue fails? At some point, talk just can't keep continuing, someone has to do something or someone does something, then what do you do? Uh, who are you asking? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, yeah, we can uh, argue about what is an existential threat or not to, to the end of time. For me, it's very simple. Is this system a credible replacement for another system? That was what the Cold War was about, right? right? And clearly, to my mind, neither Russia nor China is a credible alternative to another system, right? Mr. Xi Jinping has tried to pretend that, that China provides an alternative model of development, but that's a very trite statement. Uh, China's trajectory of development is, in its broad outline, no different from Japan, Singapore, <laughs> uh, you know, which is basically to adapt to a Western-defined modernity, <laughs> right? And some have been more successful at it than others, okay? That's the hard fact of life, whether you like it or not. But dialogue, yeah, look, you know, I'm a diplomat, so I made my living for almost 40 years having dialogues, but not every dialogue is born equal, you know? <laughs> okay? Some dialogues are utter waste of time. Some dialogues are engaged in as an alternative to doing something else. <laughs> uh, and we are not at in quite a dire situation as we may like to pretend or may different countries like to pretend for different reasons. I think there are still channels of communication open between the US and China. Um, they are fragile, as we have seen, uh, can be disrupted by a lot of hot air, namely a balloon, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right? Uh, but they exist. There was a, some talk with, at the Munich Security Forum. There will, Mr. Biden says he's willing to talk to Mr. C, and I think they will talk. I don't think, I think the competition is real, it is fierce, it can be very dangerous, but I see a glimmer of hope in the sense that neither side <laughs> wants it to go too far. Neither side is willing to roll over uh, for the other, but neither side wants to go too far, right? And I um, ultimately don't believe that conflict, that com competition is not conflict, and competition does not necessarily always lead to conflict. And I don't think either of them wants conflict. The danger in US-China relations is not lack of dialogues. The danger is not one side or the other resorting to war as an instrument of policy, as Mr. Putin did in Ukraine and totally bungled, right? 
the danger is an accident getting out of hand. <laughs> and that accident and that possibility is greatest over the Taiwan Straits. Now, dialogues, they go on. Some are good, some are bad, some are useful, some are useless, you know, and some, you know, are uh, just boring, all right? But we have, there are channels of communication. It's not as if they, have, they are completely cut off. Not enough, we can argue. <laughs> Maybe not deep enough, not at the right level, we can argue about all that. But there is dialogue going on. Um, not all dialogues are verbal, mind you. There's a whole dialogue con conducted by signaling, right? Uh, and that's going on. That's China. Russia is another matter. I think the problem is much more serious in Russia because I don't believe Mr. Putin can afford to be seen to lose, cannot even afford to talk about a settlement that he cannot present as a clear victory <laughs> because otherwise that's the end of Mr. Putin. <laughs> Mind you, that's not something that we should look forward to because the alternative to Mr. Putin in the immediate alternative, may be worse than him. Because most of the criticism of the war is coming from the right. <laughs> it's not coming from the liberal in Russia, if there are any left. So that's my answer to you, or maybe my avoiding answering you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you are willing to say no, something? It, oh, it, please, it, please. Just, uh, briefly. We still have some minutes. Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, of course, we need uh, foreign ministry. <laughs> you know, you need a negotiation always, so you have to have a dialogue always. And if you uh, think of uh, the U.S.-Soviet uh, relations, and uh, U.S. probably never thought uh, oh, U.S. can change the you know, Soviet Union. Never, probably. But this time, China, the, you know, the engagement policy was that uh, U.S. thought uh, China could be changed into something like American society, but uh, totally failed. So now the U.S. think uh, the China is different. So the U.S.-Soviet relations, of course, you know, and then there was a certain the differences, and then U.S. never <laughs> thought, uh, you know, they could change uh, the Soviet Union, and then started the dialogue, uh, you know, the SALT and others, and of course, uh, you know, the the nuclear developments was so serious, and then uh, started uh, kind of a dialogue. So, in that sense, U.S.-China relations now, U.S. cannot change, uh, you know, China. That, that now, now they realize. Probably there is some room in the future, probably may you know, try to have some dialogue and uh, may develop. But it might be too optimistic. Of course, so many problems and also domestically, how many, you know, the anti-China sentiment in the States and uh, US, even in China, anti-US sentiment too. So it's very di difficult to be adjust. But at the same time, you know, we have to think of uh, the dialogues, that's quite important. Otherwise, just, just go to war? No. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, uh, time is almost uh, coming to the end. <laughs> so I don't try to summarize uh, this debate. And let me say that uh, this was a very stimulative uh, discussion taking place. Of course, uh, from tomorrow on, we will continue this dialogue, uh, Ukraine, and uh, the, the problem in the region and so forth. But uh, today's discussion was reflective of some of the uh, uh, urgency of the issues, both in the European and Asia Pacific theater. So uh, uh, I simply want to thank you all uh, for raising the question and uh, thought-provoking, uh, you know, uh, uh, way of uh, putting a gender, and also thank uh, uh, everyone uh, for participating and listening uh, to us uh, very patiently with this debate. Uh, and uh, I would end this here and uh, thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.